you're, if your gist is running, the mic might be still in there, but I, yeah. I don't hear Brazzy right now. You don't? I'm here. I don't uh -oh. know. I, that could be me, too. Yeah. Okay. It seems to totally be me, because now uh, my audio got rerouted. Sorry, hold on. Uh -oh. How about now? I'm I'm recovered and I'm good. Okay, good. Although I don't know where Anson is. Yeah, well he'll probably be here in a minute. I don't know if I want to start before he shows up, but <laughs> well, why don't I start and then like I'll let him in. So let me share my screen, and we can do this. Um. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. good. So this is the, the um, may or may not have anything to do with information theory uh, image selection here. And so why don't we start? Okay. So this is Claude Shannon. He was a uh, I think I talked about him before. He was the sort of the originator of modern information theory, what we think of as information theory. He worked at Bell Labs and he had a lot of different things that he did. Uh, he was a juggler and he built like these little uh, mouse robots and put them in mazes. And um, that, you know, that was, uh, there he is. So one of the things that he's best known for was uh, information theory. And uh, information theory, quantitative information theory, I should say. And uh, so this is the Shannon Weaver model of communication. And so you can see that it talks about communication in terms of a channel. And so he was interested in sending messages over uh, telegraph cables and, and trying to figure out how to encode those messages and clean them up so that you didn't get a lot of noise. And so this is efficient transmission of a signal over a noisy channel. And so the idea was that you could use mathematics to take binary values of a string and figure out how much information was in it. Uh, and basically, you would have expected versus unexpected configurations of messages. So like if a message had a certain structure of zeros and ones, you could identify it as like some, you know, describing something, even if it was corrupted or if it had noise in it. And so that was the idea. And so the equation is actually fairly simple. Um, there are no integrals in this version, but uh, this is a summation sign here. This is information entropy. So people will talk about information. They'll talk about information entropy. Uh, entropy being like uh, a lot of variation versus very, you know, a, a lot of homo homogeneity. So if it's all zeros, it's there's no entropy. If there's zero one zero one zero one, there that's a lot of entropy or maximum entropy, some people might call it. But you basically take something here and you take the log of it and you sum over all of those instances and you get this information entropy. So this thing that you're logging or the probability of events or states of a single instance. So you have this instance of something, you look at the probability of it, like in that string I told you about with zeros and ones, you might have a probability of ones and then that probability is logged, and it's logged at the base of n, which if you're dealing with binary very you know binary strings, you can use log and you know n equals two. But if you're looking at continuous values, and some applications do that, you can use log 10. Some people use log e, which is the natural log that has its own applications. Uh, and then the second part of the equation are the sum of all probabilities for an entire ensemble. So an ensemble is just a collection of uh, variables that you want to measure its information in. 
and then you have this HX, which is the actual information over this ensemble. So this symbol here is just the sum sign from I to N, N being not log N, but whatever your number in your ensemble is. Um, and so that's pretty simple. But to apply it to something practical, we need to look to other, uh, we don't need to worry about the equation so much. One of those things is a weather forecast. So this is a nice little comic. It's, it's a joke. It's supposed to be like if you look at like the five day weather forecast versus the five trillion year weather forecast, which is like, you know, for the planet is destroyed in five trillion years and we're in space. So, the you know, there's no real information in this. Uh, that the idea behind this is that weather forecasts often contain varying degrees of information. And if you're in a case like this where you have it's basically the same conditions for most of the forecast, there's really no information in that forecast. But if you have a forecast where, like this, where you have, you know, the temperature goes up and then it goes down like this, so you have a, a large range in temperatures, there's a lot of information in this forecast. Okay, so uh, that's the idea, that if I have, if things go as expected, there's already no information for me to worry about. If there are things that happen that are, like, variable, then, you know, maybe... Uh, it's it's raining and sunny on alternate days during the week. That's something that I need to know. That's information I need to know. And so there's information in that forecast. And so the most variation denotes the most information. But the sampling interval is also important. So in this case of the 5 trillion year weather forecast, you're sampling at a scale where, you know, the phenomenon is the planet's been destroyed, now you're in space for the rest of the time. Whereas in this case, you know, a five-day forecast during the middle of winter, it's just the same weather. It's just like a typical, uh, you know, northeastern North American winter where the temperature is always like this. And sometimes you get cold snaps, but this is where you have the, uh, you know, it's there's very little information in this other than the rain showers. But uh, so, but, you know, so if there's uniformity, it's not informative. But to capture the true and meaningful state for each element in the ensemble, you want something at the appropriate time scale or spatial scale. And so this is something called Polya's urn. And this tells you something about how you sample uh, from a distribution to get information or to evaluate information. And so I don't know if they covered this uh, little thought experiment in Neuromatch, but this is something that's often used in probability uh, especially when you're talking about sampling with replacement or without replacement. So this is an urn, and this has a bunch of colored balls in it. And say that I can't see inside the urn. They show the balls for convenience sake. But say I don't see anything, and I can't see through the urn, and I want to pick balls out of it. And I want to predict what color ball balls are in, what the distribution of the colors are in this urn, just by sampling it one at a time. And so I pick balls out. And I can either just take them out one at a time without replacing them, or I can sample with replacement. And so if I sample with replacement, it changes the uh, distribution of what's in the urn. But if I sample with without replacement, I can eventually get all of the uh, states and, and their distributions out on the table. And so uh, this is a, uh, a tool people use to talk about distributions, but it's also good for information because we understand that the red balls are one state and the green balls are another state. And now you can think of that as like 0 and 1 in the binary case. And what we want to do is assess the amount of information in this urn, given the color and, and distribution of the color of these balls. Uh, if we have a lot of red balls, there's very little information in that urn. Every time we pick something out, it's going to be red. If it's a mix of red and green, then we have no idea what we're going to get when we pick out of the urn. And so that's the idea of information. What is the, are you going to be surprised when you pick out of that urn and find something? Or is that something that you're, you can expect there always to be a red or always to be a green ball coming out of it? I'm going to talk about surprise in a couple slides. I didn't put that in before mutual information, but so mutual information then is the combination of information from two categories. So uh, sometimes we're interested in taking those two categories and finding what information they have in common. So say you have two variables that are independent, x and y, and the 
HX and HY are the information in each of those variables. So your variables are, you know, they have a noise component and a information component. And so your X and Y are going to have, both have information. And if you compare them, there's some overlap in the information part. And that's your HXY. So, uh, you know, if you compare the two variables, there's a mutual dependence of those two variables. And that's your information. And that's the idea of yeah, mutual information. People will use this for, um, you know, looking at different categories of, of like gene expression or different categories of like perception. If you have two categories and you want to know if there's like an interaction between them or some dependence between them, we've talked about causality and neural match. This might be a tool for looking at that. Uh, it's a good, it's a good way to do it. And it's, um, uh, it's, it's a kind of a hard measure to get your head around, but, you know, but it's uh, something worth looking into if you're interested. Um, semantic information is then, you might ask, well, if we have these binary strings, that's just the structure of the data. It's not really describing the meaning of the data. But people have thought about this. And so uh, semantic information, people have been working on this in, in different computer science labs. Uh, this is a measure of semantic ambiguity and uninformativeness. So it's, it operates like standard information theory, where you have a bunch of things distributed over a, a string or, or a, a set of data, and you want to find out the relative frequency of different states. And so in this case, each word in a sentence can be mapped to the next word. So if I take this sentence, the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, I can take the word brown, given the word quick, and I can calculate the probability of those two things being linked together. If I do that, then it tells me that these words co-occur, but I still need to calculate the frequency in my corpus, such as the body of text, of this co-occurrence. And so I can do this for every word and get a bunch of different conditional probabilities and then look at their frequency. And so what you find, of course, is if two words are linked, there might be a semantic connection between them. So like brown fox is a semantic connection because it des brown describes the color of a fox. And so people use this uh, to tell, you know, if there's semantic content in, in a bunch of words. Uh, these people also use uh, techniques like bag of words and engrams to characterize sentences. But this is different. I wanted to make that clear. This is different from those kind of methods because they use uh, conditional probabilities, and then ultimately they'll use the information theory measure to look at the content. And then there's Fisher information, which is where you measure information uh, of random variable x that's contained in parameter theta. And so what this is, is Fisher information is a good way to look at like a, a model-free data set and compare it to sort of a model of the data or of the of the variable. So parameter theta is a description of this, uh, say, distribution of data. It's a theoretical distribution. And random variable x is something you're observing in the environment. And you want to know how much information from the environment is contained in that theoretical distribution. So parameter theta is the mean and standard deviation of the distribution that models x. But you want to know the about the actual measure of x, which might vary quite a bit from the theoretical model of the distribution. And so you can use Fisher information to, to quantify that relationship. And they actually use this in Bayesian likelihood estimation, which is why I brought it up. This is where you estimate a prior from an observation of data. So if you see Fisher information, you kind of know what it is now. Uh, there's also the callback Liebler divergence, which is measuring the similarity calculating the log odds ratio between two distributions. So you have these two distributions that you want to find the amount of information that's shared between them. It's kind of like the mutual information. One variable is going to predict uh, something about another variable, but we don't know how much of that. And so this is the equation here. It's similar to information theory, except it's a ratio here instead of a, a just a simple probability. We had a question in the comments here. Uh, a couple questions. Uh, Prakash, if I recall correctly, there was a study on selection of particular words in a conversation between healthy subjects and how it can predict who will become schizophrenic 
over a period of time. It's good. Sounds really cool. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, that's, it, there are a lot of applications to these methods. So if you have one that you think is great, put it in the chat. Um, so a lot of what I'm talking about is pretty theoretical stuff, but you know, you're going to find that it's going to apply to a lot of different things, potentially. So now this is something that Jesse and, and Anson might find interesting. This is Gibsonian information. And so this isn't like a formal uh, set of equations, but this is how J.J. Gibson here thought about information. And it's very different from like Shannon information in that motion, visual motion in particular, provides information. So if we look at Gibson here, he's static. But if we look at him now over on the right, He's, I have, you know, this thing that's simulating is motion through space. And so you can see that this is like a representation of the motion, but it has information in the motion. If he's moving versus static, there's, there's information that I'm getting from that image. And so there are a lot of uh, things in, in J.J. Gibson wrote a book on um, ecological psychology. And in that book, he talks a lot about optical flow and structure from motion where if something is in the like something is camouflaged in the, in the woods in, in the background you don't notice it but when it starts moving against that background you start to notice that thing and so that's motion providing information and as far as i've known no one's given that a mathematical treatment but this is the this is just like it's just a, something to be aware of we can maybe talk about this uh, after neuromatch but here's surprise now. We finally get to surprise. So back in the Polya's urn slide, I talked about being surprised by your selection of a ball from the urn. And so, but this is also a perceptual thing. Uh, this is a perceptual uh, thing that they measure in, in um, like, I think they're using it in some of the brain theories of Friston and so forth. Oh, you don't have to look at that right now. Okay. okay. <laughs> But yeah, I was saying, saying it'd be cool to compare those things. things. It would be, yeah. So um, this is uh, sometimes people call Bayesian surprise, but the basic idea of surprise is that if I observe something like flipping a coin, which you see up at the upper right, and I want to observe this occurrence of events, uh, you know, what what can I gain out of that? What's surprising to me about coin flips? We assume coin flips are like a 50-50 proposition. You flip a coin, it's heads or tails, but if you actually flip a coin for like a sequence of maybe 50 or 100 flips, you notice that they're actually drift from that expectation. But what about this coin flipping is surprising to you? I mean, is there something that's going to, is there a result that's surprising? And how much information does that have? So we can use this, uh, this formulation of information, or this sort of the last half of the information equation, 1 over px, which is kind of a normalization uh technique and then you have this coin exper flipping experiment for 10 trials so the expectation is five heads and five tails and that's one bit of information um and that's sort of the maximal you know variation but there's a, a something else you don't want to necessarily measure the maximum amount of variation here you want to measure how often or infrequently does the thing i'm interested in occur and so in that case we have two examples. So in the first we have where you end up flipping the coin and you get nine heads and one tail with a probability. We're looking for the probability of tails and we find that it's very rare. So it's surprising to find a tail. So it's a probability of point, 0 0.1 and that gives you 3.32 bits as it works out with this equation. You actually, there's a lot of information in that because you don't see it that often. So if you don't see it, then you can't say that tails ever occurs. But if you observe it once, it's surprising, and there's a lot of information in that observation. Uh, then to take the take the reverse case, you see nine heads in one tail. But now we're looking at the probability of heads. And so the probability of heads isn't surprising at all. If you get a head, of course you're going to get a head. It almost always happens. So you get a probability of 0 0.9, and that's a very low information content of 0.15 bits. And so you can see, like, the perspective matters as well in information theory. You have to define a lot of things within that simple equation. What, what's your perspective? What's, you know, what's, uh, what counts as information? Um, you know, there's a nominal, a nominal 
uh, definition, but we have to think about these things. So uh, information theory has also been used in psychophysics a lot. And so back in the 50s, information theory was kind of like the deep learning of its day. Everyone seemed to think they could apply it to human cognition. And so there are a couple people who you might look into. Um, at Neve, who is, uh, he looked at the problem in this way. Uh, the perceptual machinery strips away redundancy in a stimulus. So when you look at something, it, it strips away that redundancy that you have in the environment. So you're just getting like the basic information of what's in the environment and not like maybe the background or anything. Um, this encodes information more economically and information uses uncertainty. So they're looking at it in terms of sort of an economy of processing and then ultimately decision making. Um, Quassler did a study called the Studies of Human Channel Capacity. So he's looking at human cognition as information processing. And of course, this uh, predates cognitive science, but cognitive science and the cognitive revolution in psychology kind of comes out of this uh, line of thought. And then finally, you have people like Fitz, who developed Fitz Law, and also the idea of the magical number seven in working memory. And so, do you know the laws? And so these are the psychological laws, you might psychophysical laws you might be familiar with, Hicks Law, Fitz Law, Miller's Law. And so, uh, Hicks Law is, of course, based on information theory. You see the uh, a similar formulation to what you saw in the first slides. This is looking at reaction time given a number of options. So this is where you have a number of things to choose from, and you have a reaction time to pick one of those things. And so if you measure the reaction time for that, as it turns out, as you increase the number of options, your reaction time goes up, but it doesn't go up linearly. It goes up in this sort of curvilinear fashion, this logarithmic fashion, where you, the more options you have, eventually you start to treat, like, you know, you, you see three options, you choose between the three options. If you see an array of 16 options, you might be able to pick it out in terms of, like, its relative position in that array. And so it saves you some time in picking out or figuring out where it is. You don't have to observe every single position. You kind of know where it is. And so um, psychophysical laws were built around this measurement of information. Um, Hicks law, of course, we've talked about. And it's important to note that, like, and this is important for the next slide as well, that your criterion for what is information or what is a bit is going to change with your context. And so in Hicks law, we kind of see that. But in Miller's Law, we really see that. And so Miller's Law is, is this idea of working memory allowing you to hold seven plus or minus two items at any one time. And so people have done experiments where they've had people recite numbers or letters or words, and they can hold like seven, roughly seven objects at one time. All right. So this is the basis for like a lot of the research on multitasking. You know, what is it that you can hold in working memory and what distracts you, what makes you forget things in short term memory? And so you can see this graph down here. There's channel capacity, and you have different things that you can remember in terms of their element size. And so, but then, so this limit of working memory is called capacity. So this is similar to Shannon's channel capacity. The problem, though, is that how do you define an item? So an item could be a single letter, or as it turns out, you can actually chunk these letters into words and chunk the words into sentences. And so it makes it pretty flexible, right? You talk about information having a capacity. Well, if you take single letters, there's a capacity for that. But if you take single, like, whole sentences, there's a capacity for that. But that's a very different amount of information if you think about it in terms of, go back to, like, thinking about it in terms of the letters. So there's that slipperiness of the definition. And maybe it turns out that, you know, you can make things more efficient by using like one element in that in that sentence you know there are different coding strategies but it's important to recognize that i think when evaluating this kind of work uh, but nevertheless we can think about it in as term in terms of capacity but there's also integrated information which is a more recent uh idea and this is not thinking about information in terms of capacity at all this is thinking about information in terms of like uh, sort of the information that we're getting out of the environment and how we operate on it. 
And so this is a, it's, I don't know if you've heard about integrated information. They talk about it a lot in consciousness research. This is the citation down at the bottom of the slide. This is a Nature Review Neuroscience article uh, on integrated information. And it basically uh, reduces a lot of the higher level representation that we do uh, down to like a single measure of integrated information. And so, you know, you, you experience the world, you build a conceptual structure. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that goes on in the brain. And then we can measure that in terms of integrated information. And it's supposed to allow us to like understand consciousness a little bit better because it's dealing with this experiential aspect of learning. And so this is far different from the capacity model, but it still uses the same basic idea of information. Um, and then I just kind of added in positional information. So we can even go beyond perception and think about things like biological development. And so there, people have applied uh, the idea of information theory to positional information in embryos. And so in embryos, the cells divide and they have this, there's a hypothesis that they understand their position in the embryo and that their position is important for this defining their identity. So cells differentiate and they form structures and then their position in that structure, their position in the embryo, determines where they end up going, you know, their fate in, in embryogenesis and that sort of thing. So uh, there's a paper, Positional Information in Bits, where they talk about uh, finding the information content of an embryo. So they argue that every nucleus can be labeled with a unique identity and that an embryo has log two n bits of information, which means that whatever this unique identity is, that's the uh, information content of an embryo. And so I give that example because people have tried to measure the information content of the genome and it's been pretty sloppy because they've talked about like well what do you use as a level of analysis do you use like the base pairs do you use like what the genes produce do you use like you know what what's the unit of measurement and so in this case they're using cells they're actually using a nucleus label but that's not really a good measure of information in an embryo because the cells express a lot of different genes and they change their identity throughout development and so there are good things about this that allows you to model the sort of positional information but it also doesn't allow you to understand like information variability in a single sort of uh, unit in the ensemble so finally i give this slide again for uh anson and jesse and this is linking information to the evergood regulator theorem and so there's this idea of, uh, there's this, in, in, we talk about, um, W.R. Ashby's, uh, Ever Good Regulator Theorem in this group a lot. And he has this requisite variety condition and states that variety is the total number of possible states in a system. Um, variety can destroy variety, but the, what happens is you have the environment and you have this internal model. And this is just in the brain, but Ashby talks about models. But we'll talk about this in terms of the brain and internal model. Um, these models, the environment and the internal model, both have to have the same amount of information. All right. And so variety can destroy variety by compressing, filtering, or some other mechanism to make sure that these representations have roughly the same amount of, of information. And so, again, like when I talked about perception, you know, that's an interesting point because what your perceptual system might be doing is taking uh, information out of the environment, destroying maybe redundancy, and compressing that down into what it thinks is the amount of information that matches the environment. Um, so but you, when you apply Newton's third law, you find that there has to be this sort of balance of information between the, informa between the internal model and the environment. So one of the things that happens is offloading from like the internal model into the environment. So the, when the environment contains too much information, something called cognitive offloading occurs, where you take things from the brain and you put them in the environment. It could be like in a desktop, like where you leave things on your desktop to remind you. It could be like sticky notes, or it could be like signposts out in the environment. And those are things that where, when the environment is too complex, you compensate by building this model of offloading. But it also suggests that you can take the, the internal model and the offloaded 
information and use it to interpret the environment. So this is something that I just kind of threw in here to get people thinking about that if you're interested. And uh, I thought I thought that was an interesting relationship there. I, I ran across some stuff on the good regulator theorem while I was researching this, so I thought I'd bring it up. I don't really have any more insights into it. But anyways, that's the end of the talk. I hope everyone's enjoyed it. I know it was a little rough getting here, but thank you for paying attention. No, no, I, I, I enjoyed it. Okay. So uh, if you have any questions... Uh, There's like a whole bunch, bunch of stuff, stuff I could say about so. the regular regulator theorem and everything else, um, but I don't. I'll, I'll probably say that afterwards because I don't want to yeah. bore everybody with that. If the only way that we're going to do to this with the, with the wire thing, thing, like how much in, uh, how can we process this with the least amount of information possible? Yeah, we were able to the Shannon into the thing. Yeah, um, and I, I think, uh, let me try to find one of the slides about something. Um, yeah, there's, there's so many things in Neuromax that are like really, um, it's like really right on the cusp of what we're learning um, directly, and even like, like, like positional information and a lot of the, the way, um, I'm trying to find one. Another slide, but yes, yeah, yeah, suffice, suffice to say, say um, it's, it's very, very much, much a lot, especially, especially I think in, in like, like you know, I, I realize, realize that like Bayes, like, like the guy Bayes, is actually, actually, you know, a few centuries in development. In development. He, like he's originally, originally, originally from like the 1700s or the 1800s, 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 I forget. But just like the underpinning of a lot of these things is is really interesting. But yeah. Yes. Any other questions? I'll put the slides up on uh, in Slack for people to look at. And uh, if you have any questions, you can contact me in Slack or talk about it. Um, I just wanted to kind of go through this because I know you didn't really get exposure to it, but I thought it might be useful. Is there a specific Slack channel that would be good? Because I was I was looking to to. Have, have a real, like, like post, post some stuff, stuff or the slides, slides here. here. Is there a specific, specific Slack, Slack channel that you, that you think would go best for these, or should I make something about information or something like that? that. I don't um, know. We could do that. Yeah, we could have an information channel. There's, um, there's, there's much time, time, but I don't. I don't know how to really. Well, yeah. yeah. Let me look over the channels. I don't. You know, I don't have a working memory of all the channels because we can only get <laughs> seven things in there. So, um, I yeah, I, I'll look it over. I think we might make a channel for it, but we might also. Because there are too just, many channels, it's hard to monitor all of them, you know. Yeah. And I, uh, I mean, you can even put it in the meta brain ones, ones, but I know Anson and I talk, we've mentioned in, 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 integrated information theory and a lot of the, this stuff here, so I mean, I think there'll be something to follow up on. But as for today, I mean, uh, it was great. And I, don't, I think that's, is there anything else we want to talk about today? I know everybody's kind of got to go or we're done yeah. at this point. Okay. Well, if there's nothing else, yeah. If there are other questions, we can we can put them in Slack. If there are any other questions, uh, if you have questions about the project, please raise them in Slack as well. I think that's a good tool to use for, especially this weekend when you're kind of going through and trying to get into the doing everything. And then by Wednesday, we should have a present a short presentation, and we can talk about that in Slack. And if people want to meet about that early next week, we can uh, have like a short meeting and. So it should be, but it should be fine, and we can. I can give feedback on on Slack as well. So, all right. Well, thanks for meeting. Uh, good luck with week three of Neural Match. Week three. Yep. <laughs> and uh, talk to everyone later. Take care, everybody. Have a good weekend. Take care. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye.